Uh, Dr. Uh, Wolf Powers is a professor of urban policy and planning at Hunter College in New York City. Uh, and we in CRP are actually pretty thrilled to have uh, Laura with us uh, today. Uh, in addition to this lecture, uh, she has generously met with our students, our faculty, and our alumni already today. So if she seems a little bit tired, it's our fault because we've actually had her in meetings all day and we uh, appreciate her generosity. Um, we actually had a little bit of a test of our uh, conflict resolution skills in our city and regional planning section uh, about Laura's visit because so many of us wanted the opportunity to introduce uh, Laura tonight. <laughs> tonight. Um, but in the end, uh, we negotiated amongst ourselves that I would introduce Laura, and I'm privileged to do that uh, tonight. One of the privileges of leadership is, so a good negotiation. Um, so Laura studies neighborhood revitalization and urban and regional economic development policy and planning. Her work explores the challenges of planning for community development under conditions of structural social inequality. Her work offers insights into the ways in which city politics are mediated through policies governing the built environment and the urban economy. And she considers how planners and civil society organizations together influence those policies. Uh, Dr. Wolf Powers has taught city planning at uh, the Pratt Institute, the University of Pennsylvania, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard and Columbia University. Uh, she uh, earned her PhD in urban planning and policy from Rutgers University, uh, and her dissertation won the best dissertation award from the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning. She has a, a master's degree uh, from Princeton and a, a BA in American Studies, go American Studies, from uh, Yale University. Um, Many of our CRP stu students actually know uh, Laura's work uh, on uh, the development of maker spaces, uh, the upzoning and rezoning of urban industrial property, and the pedagogical challenges of teaching planners to deal. And the reason I know that is I've assigned all of those articles <laughs> to our students. Um, by following the trends in economic development at close range from Boston to Philadelphia over three decades, uh, her research has provided exceptional insights about, the community econ about community economic development and the public, private, and institutional actors driving the direction of economic developing, development planning, both in practice and as a discipline. Uh, tonight, Laura will be sharing with us her most recent work, a new book, University City, History, Race, and Community in the Era of in the Innovation District. It has just been published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. Uh, this work is particularly pertinent to those of us here at Ohio State and in the College of in Engineering as uh, we uh, embark on our own Innovation District project here in Columbus. In the book, University City, uh, Laura chronicles five decades of planning in and around the communities of West Philadelphia's University City to illuminate how the dynamics of innovation district development in the present both depart from and connect to the politics of mid 20th century urban renewal. I know many of you know that from your uh, urban history and planning history courses. Um, drawing on archival and ethnographic research, she concludes that even as university and government leaders vow to develop without displacement, what existing residents value is imperiled when innovation-driven redevelopment remains accountable to the property market. Uh, the book first traces the municipal and institutional politics that empowered officials to demolish a predominantly black neighborhood near the University of Pennsylvania and Drexel University in the late 1960s to make way for the University City Science Center and University City High School. The book also provides new insight into organizations whose members experimented during that same period with alternative conceptions of economic advancement. The book then shifts to the present, documenting contemporary efforts to position university-adjacent neighborhoods as locations for prosperity built on scientific knowledge. Placing Philadelphia's innovation districts in the context of similar development taking place around the United States, University City advocates a reorientation of redevelopment practice around the recognition that despite their negligible worth in real estate terms, the time, care, and energy people invest in their local environments and in one another are actually precious urban resources. 
So please join me in welcoming Dr. Laura Wolf Powers to the Knowlton School tonight. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for that generous introduction. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here with all of you uh, today. Um, as Jennifer noted, um, my, the talk is that I'm going to deliver this evening is based on my new book, University City, which came out about a month ago from University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, there were kind of three vantage points that, that from which I was working and that made me interested in the material that I'm going to present tonight. As an economic development researcher, I'm interested in um, innovation and how we, uh, how policy can promote innovation or discourage innovation. Um, as a, somebody who does community development work, I'm very interested in neighborhood revitalization and the politics involved in that. And of course, as an academic, I'm interested in how universities relate with the communities right next door to them. Um, so, for, so I really had all those three perspectives in mind as I was um, beginning, the, uh, beginning the project. And it was also somewhat opportunistic in the sense that I taught at University of Pennsylvania between 2008 and 2014. So I had the opportunity to kind of see some, what I'm, a little bit of what I'm about to talk about unfold here. Um, so just um, to, to give you a little bit of an orientation to where I'm talking about, um, the University City neighborhood uh, is in West Philadelphia, and the city, as you can see, is sort of defined by two rivers, the, the Delaware River on the east side and the Schuylkill River, which kind of uh, bisects the city, and all this part over here is known as West Philadelphia. Um, Center City is sort of, sort of the traditional downtown, but in the last... 10 years or so, there's been a lot of um, buzz and rumor about how uh, Center City is kind of expanding west, and there's uh, terms like Silicon Valley are being bandied about uh, as a tip of the hat to um, the increase in biotechnology companies and biopharmaceutical uh, gene therapy companies and so on that are located locating near uh, Penn and Drexel, which are, are both located in this area. Penn, uh, Philadelphia does have a third university, Temple, which is, which is up here. It's not in University City. Um, anyway, um, so the, um, you know, within University City, I'm, I'm really talking about um, this area, which is right next to the Schuylkill River, and it just, um, this is the 30th Street train station. If you've ever taken the train between Boston and Washington, it's a major stop. And um, it's, it's known as the Lower Lancaster Corridor. It's defined by this, uh, this street here, Lancaster Avenue, um, which actually predates most of what else was, is in the area now. It doesn't fit into the street grid because it was originally a Native American trail and then it was a turnpike. But at any rate, um, you know, I was teaching at Penn, um, but this area was kind of off the beaten track um, and it was much closer to Drexel, obviously. And the two neighborhoods that uh, I became very fascinated by were um, Powelton Village, um, which is located here, and, and then Mantua, which is a, a fairly economically distressed neighborhood um, and has been you know, since the, the uh, middle of the 20th century. Um, so the, the story that I'm going to tell, it starts in the 1950s and 60s with the effort to transform uh, land adjacent to Penn and Drexel's campuses using the tools of urban renewal. And this is sort of the emblem uh, for the University City Science Center, which was constructed on uh, uh, the ruins of, of a neighborhood um, known as Greenwood or Greenville or, or the Black Bottom. Um, and it continues through present, present day reliance in pretty much the same location um, on the innovation district policy model as a strategy for building on the dynamism of academic research and the attractions of urbanity to generate city and region-wide economic prosperity. So these are these, are these two Drexel-sponsored projects that they're engaged in with private developers um, near the campus. Um, so University City is interesting to look at um, because it's an urban neighborhood in which municipal officials, academic institutions, and mobilized community advocates have been engaged over many decades in converse conversations and arguments about territory and political power. 
and the, also the question of who benefits and who sacrifices as a result of university-sponsored redevelopment and related economic and social policies. Um, in trying to understand what had changed and what had not changed between the urban renewal era, uh, during which, as Jennifer mentioned, there had been um, wholesale demolition of uh, neighborhoods to make way for new, new science-led development, um, I wanted to understand what was different um, and what had remained the same uh, over time. And uh, what I concluded is that property-driven economic development, and, and I'm arguing that that is essentially um, a lot of what innovation district development often boils down to is uh, real estate investment. Um, it can only, exceed, uh, only succeed in meeting equity and inclusion goals if cities and universities are willing to take a different approach to the management of land and land markets in neighborhoods adjacent to campus expansion projects. So in this talk, I'm going to do a few things. First, I'm going to un unpack the economic logic underlying the innovation district. And this is, uh, again, as Jennifer mentioned, a policy that academic institutions across the United States are pursuing today in close partnership with uh, development companies and municipal governments. Um, and it's, I specifically want to understand how the in innovation district's po policy logic aligns with or departs from the spatial principles articulated in economists' work on industrial clustering and agglomeration. Um, secondly, I'm going to briefly discuss the history of the West Philadelphia redevelopment politics that kind of form the core narrative of my book, um, concentrating on the racialized conflicts over property ownership and political citizenship that are coming up repeatedly over uh, the course of the decades and which um, are extending to current debates about the innovation district projects going on right now. Third, I'm going to go into some detail about Drexel University's particular adaptation of the Innovation District model, uh, which features both aggressive claims on campus adjacent space and a strong commitment to social inclusion and economic opportunity uh, in conjunction with university-led redevelopment. Um, finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, civic mobilization among West Philadelphia community organizations affected by new development and specifically its uh, impact on housing costs um, and place that in the context of larger dilemmas that are taking place wherever universities are pursuing property investment near their campuses. So uh, just to start with uh, my first topic, innovation-led growth. Um, Joseph Schumpeter, um, in the, er, the mid-20th century, named innovation as kind of the crucial source of capitalist dynamism. And ever since then, people in the economic development field have been borderline obsessed with innovation. <laughs> how to generate it, how to maintain it, uh, you know, what are the conditions for, for it. Um, and researchers have extensively studied the spatial concentration of innovative activity, establishing that enterprises that succeed in commercializing uh, basic science tend to agglomerate in geographies where there are certain auspicious combinations of factors present like human capital, dynamic uh, supplier-purchaser relationships, social environments where entrepreneurs have a chance to inspire each other and inform each other's work. Um, and scholars have also combined Schumpeter's work with that of the economist Alfred Marshall, who used the term industrial district to describe places where ideas and know-how spill over to firms in related industries. And you know, here you see a classic article by Ann Markison on different types of late 20th century industrial districts. Recent scholarship places research universities at the center of these dynamics, so you have um, Atzkowitz and Leidensdorf proposing the metaphor of a triple helix to characterize the intertwined roles of universities, firms, and government in promoting innovation-led growth in particular places. And Sharon Zukin also adopts that framework in her work on innovation development in New York City. But as a number of scholars have pointed out, science-led economic development in the post-World War II period has tended to happen not in cities, but overwhelmingly in suburbs and exurbs. Um, urban research complexes like the University City Science Center in Philadelphia were exceptional, and they were only modestly successful. The most celebrated innovation clusters thrived along freeways and in office parks designed to be 
contained and self-contained and distant from the urban fray. Much of the academic research on spatially concentrated innovation in the United States has focused not on cities, but in fact on metropolitan regions. But proponents of the 20th century innovation district embrace the urban core. Bruce Katz and Jennifer Wagner of the Brookings Institution are, herald a remarkable shift by which innovative firms and talented workers congregate in compact amenity rich enclaves in the central city core. Moreover, instead of the self-contained lab and off office-dominated research com complexes that characterized the 1950s and 1960s, present-day innovation development in proximity to universities includes housing, hotels, retail, and public spaces. Um, so this 2015 Philadelphia Magazine article about one of uh, West Philadelphia's new innovation districts drew attention to walkable streets, retail, central public square. Thus, um, while economic development policymakers extol innovation districts as places where knowledge workers are collaborating on the ground uh, to create discoveries and translate basic science into usable applications, the design of these districts centers residential and leisure spaces, spaces and it's fundamentally based on partnerships between um, universities and real estate developers. Um, so the, and what attracts the investors to this model is the promise of economic return on non-commercial development on university land in so-called live, work, play environments. Innovation scholars originally conceived the triple helix metaphor to describe a process by which academic researchers collaborate with industry and government. Um, but you know, in this new model, you have more often university real estate departments collaborating with property entrepreneurs to develop these new urban spaces through in this innovation district P3 model with the expectation that they will become destinations for technology intensive firms and labor. Um, so while the, the business, the innovation and the businesses are the end goal, um, the way that we're getting there is through real estate investment. So um, live, work, play environments and the role of private development partners in, in accomplishing them was definitely on Drexel University officials' minds in 2012 when they introduced a new campus plan and strategic plan. Um, and the, the, the plan specifically highlighted this, this blue area right here um, as a, a at the site of a 21st century district marked by livability, amenity, and accessibility. Um, and it, you know, it sort of was clear that, that they were thinking about enlarging the area of University City that was gonna be associated with Drexel, um, or you know, that people would associate with Drexel. Um, and it, so that was right here. Um, and then there was a second in innovation district that was sort of planned here on kind of unused rail yards and some, some derelict uh, industrial properties over um, ne next to the 30th Street train station. But, um, but what the plan didn't say was that um, the first innovation district, which was being called U City Square, um, was located in an area with an extremely tormented political history an area where a black neighborhood containing 1,407 homes had been bulldozed in the late 1960s to make way for the University City Science Center and a new public high school, University City High School. So it was an area that had been an epicenter center of protest and conflict in the past. So in my research, I wanted to center the perspective of residents of these nearby neighborhoods um, and who, um, in many cases, remembered the redevelopment of these sites. Um, and to kind of understand, you know, to, to convey in this talk why this is important, I, we need to kind of go back in time to the late 1950s, which is what I'm gonna do now. So the first chapter of my book uh, tells the story of the West Philadelphia Corporation, which um, formed in the aftermath of the murder of a graduate student in the Powelton neighborhood um, in 1957. 
Academic administrators, especially at the University of Pennsylvania, had already been concerned that poverty and crime at their borders represented a threat, and they were interested in doing what they could to create physical and conceptual distance between gown and town. The lobbying actions of universities nationwide were instrumental in bringing about Section 112 of the Housing Act of 1959, a provision that allowed municipalities to count funding supplied by academic institutions towards the local match required to unleash federal urban renewal funding. So from here, it was not far to a, to a plan and, you know, um, to draw on federal urban renewal authority and money to demolish undesired neighborhoods and scattered their residents. So, you, know, so you see this 1958 document, um, public interest in fine medical care and good education coincides with a local and national effort to stop the blight that is corroding our cities. Um, so that was kind of part of the program from the very start. Um, so conditions in the West Philadelphia area that that document was talking about, um, this was a neighborhood alternately known as Greenville or the Black Bottom, exemplified a racial and spatial transformation that was taking place at that time throughout the urban north. The area had, gone, uh, had undergone significant growth in black population in the 1940s and 50s, and this had been caused by factors that are probably familiar to many people in this room, the, uh, the in-migration of African-American households from the rural south um, and the out-migration of white households to newly constructed and racially exclusionary working class housing in the suburbs. The poor environmental conditions of the Black Bottom emanated from the persistence of a real estate color line that crowded black households into restricted areas, forced them to pay above market rent for substandard housing, and repeatedly subjected them to displacement at the hands of various urban redevelopment efforts. So here you see the perspective of one of my interviewees um, talking about uh, her, her neighbors um, in the 1950s and 60s that you know they had they felt safe in the north, but then when they arrived, they were con subject to sort of constant, the, the constant threat of being um, displaced by redevelopment projects, um, and that there was just a lot of, uh, a lot of churn. Um, and so, you know, the fact was that, you know, these very practices, um, discriminatory practices, had, hel you know, helped to create um, the dilapidated buildings and um, desperate tenants that are talked about in this document, right? So they're saying, you know, these are terrible con living conditions, you know, only desperate tenants rent, uh, live in these areas, there's blight, there's dilapidation, you know, we need to um, expunge decay from this neighborhood, right? But in fact, there was a whole set of practices that had helped to produce these conditions. But rather than identifying that, as um, a symptom of injustice in the social order, university and city officials sort of accepted and perpetuated a narrative um, that conflated these conditions with the, the people who were residing in the neighborhoods. Um, the part of University City uh, that, that the you, you, officials were most concerned with was these 26 acres that you see right here, after, and they, they cleared them. Um, and they cleared them for the development of the Science Center, which you see a kind of model up here, and um, the University City High School between 1966 and 1969. <clears throat> and as I noted a little while ago, um, prior to demolition, this area had about 1,400 homes, um, and 264 of them, or 18% of them, were owner-occupied homes. Um, and so, you know, in this book, I also elaborate the efforts of an organized group, um, the Citizens Committee of University City Urban Renewal Area Number Three, to pre prevent the wholesale destruction of their neighborhoods. So they're they're talking about how um, there's actually been an increase in black home ownership, and um, the in the wake of the Urban Development Act, which was also urban renewal, um, many of these homes had been destroyed and. Basically, they were saying that if you that the, if the city were to allow their neighborhood to be demolished, there would be um, that would just exacerbate an already very severe housing uh, shortage. Um, so this is a, a letter that um, uh, a woman named Franny Robinson 
um, wrote to Senator Abraham Ribicoff, um, and that's where this quote comes from. Um, so you know, people were very organized, um, and they did a lot. They they worked tirelessly to to keep the neighborhood from being demolished. Um, they wrote letters like this one to Senator Ribicoff. They protested at City Hall. They litigated. Uh, they joined with Penn students to occupy the office of the president of the university, um, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee got involved, and the Congress on Racial Equality got involved, and the NAACP got involved, but none of it worked, uh, and in the end, it all ended up being cleared. Um, so I, when I talked to people um, over the course of this research who remember living and visiting this neighborhood when it was a residential neighborhood, and who remember the struggle to prevent it from being demolished and the trauma that uprooting the neighborhood uh, caused. But I also read accounts of professional planners who were inclined to justify the sacrifices and losses inflicted on the community in the name of some greater good. So you, here you have, a, a, um, he was the head of the planning commission in Philadelphia and also a professor at University of Pennsylvania saying, well, you know, in those days, these decisions were evaluated as to whether there was a gain or a loss in relationship to the total community, um, and those uh, the hardships that, that happened were essentially justified by the kind of greater good of economic development and um, urban revitalization. Um, so this tendency of policymakers to kind of valorize what they consider to be broadly beneficial economic development above the concerns and commitments of disfavored households of color is one of the themes that connects, I'm going to argue, the urban renewal culture of the mid-20th century to um, what's happening today with innovation districts. Um, there's a lot of differences, and there's many ways in which current redevelopment practices improve on the past, but there are also some common threads. Um, so with that, I turn to the present and to the policy model that Drexel has adopted in University City over the past decade or so. And I wanted to start this section by positioning myself within the story. Um, I taught, as I mentioned, in the School of Design at University of Pennsylvania um, for six years, and one of the classes that I taught was called Introduction to Community and Economic Development. Um, so I ended up organizing that course around uh, this three-quarter of a mile area of Lower Lancaster Avenue, the Lower Lancaster Corridor. Um, and you know, this was north of the area where the Science Center now existed. Um, and it was pretty far, actually, from Penn's campus. You had to, you know, it was kind of a hike to get there. Um, but um, I just, I started out the class by, you know, asking them to just um, walk up Lancaster from 34th Street to 45th Street and, and um, write up their observations. Um, and so, um, and then later on, uh, oh yes, and this was a, uh, this had been, um, this area had all been developed when, in the mid 19th century, when West Philadelphia became kind of a streetcar suburb, and there's still a trolley that runs along Lancaster Avenue. Um, so I asked the students to look, look at the retail corridor and do some work with that. I asked them to look at the housing markets in the neighborhoods surrounding the corridor. Um, and, um, you know, the, and I asked them to do a proposal for a public space intervention. And, you know, over the years of, of teaching this class, I got to know the area as it was starting to change. Um, and, you know, there were these changes that were being proposed for um, this part of West Philadelphia, and they were catalyzed primarily by partnerships in, initiated by Drexel. Um, and under this dynamic president, the new president, John Fry, Drexel was kind of engaging in strategic visioning um, and conducting outreach with nearby organizations and, and crafting transformative development projects. This was being experienced outside the develop redevelopment areas themselves as developers began to acquire vacant lots or dilapidated row homes and replace them with housing oriented towards students. This had happened decades earlier in the neighborhoods close to the University of Pennsylvania, but the neighborhoods along the alongside of Lancaster Avenue near Drexel were still quite distressed with high rates of poverty and joblessness and a lot of vacant land. So in 2013, the Philadelphia School District uh, decided to close University City High School, and um, Drexel quickly bought the building about a month later and proceeded to demolish it, um, and shortly after they introduced the City Square project. 
Um, and then at the same time, um, or around the same time, the Obama administration declared uh, a federal promise zone, which you can see in this uh, dot, white dotted line goes, that goes kind of around all this area. Um, and so this is a designation that put neighborhood projects in this zone on a kind of priority queue for federal funding for housing and education and criminal justice. Um, but it wasn't, there wasn't actually very much new money attached to it. Um, uh, as one of my informants said to me, well, you can, I, I can promise to take you to dinner, but at dinner time, you might still be hungry. <laughs> that was his assessment of the promise zone. Um, the <clears throat> um, and, then, and then there was all these other zones that it overlapped with. So you had these, these you know, these dotted lines are keystone opportunity zones where, where um, that's the Pencil, state of Pennsylvania program that, that um, abates firms from all sorts of different taxes. You had a federal opportunity zones that was courtesy of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Um, so you had all these, you know, this kind of rapid, uh, rapid proliferation of official zones and districts um, coexisting with more unofficial, more like, you know, m very much perceived but not formally declared borders and boundaries that divided safe neighborhoods from unsafe neighborhoods and dividing the university identified area from the neighborhood identified area. So this was kind of the situation where Drexel's innovation district vision was unfolding um, in, you know, starting in about 2012. Um, and so I'm now going to shift and talk about what that model looked like. Um, oh, yeah, that's a, sorry, this is, these are just a couple, this is just to, to denote where these two innovation theme developments were, um, were proposed to be located. Um, so one crucial aspect of um, the innovation district vision on Drexel's part is community engagement and social inclusion. Um, when John Fry, the president of Drexel, stood with the CEO of the Brandywine and Real Estate Investment Trust to announce the School Kill Yards Innovation Neighborhood in 2016, he proclaimed, this $3.5 billion project will benefit thousands of low-income families without disrupting the fabric of their neighborhoods. It will connect long-term economic development with sustainable social progress on a level that's never been done before. Um, and then a few weeks later, the executive vice president of Drexel um, went on the radio and talked about the university's educational programs, uh, which were housed at um, this facility called the Dornsife Center, which Drexel had developed on Spring Garden Street in Mantua, um, and that would help uh, ensure social mobility for residents of struggling neighborhoods, and that that was kind of baked into the university's development strategy. And, you know, this is, it's important to um, acknowledge that Drexel has invested an enormous amount of resources in extension services, like at the Drexel, at the uh, Dornsife Center, there's workforce development, there's entrepreneurship programs, there's educational support, there's community meals, there's legal assistance, they, they, they really are making a lot of investment in this struggling neighborhood close to their campus. Um, so that's a real thing. Um, but um, while Drexel's Office of University and Community Partnerships has one mandate, uh, its Department of Real Estate and Facilities has another. The part of the university that managed relationship with third-party development partners responded to a very different set of incentives and imperatives in the part of the institution that dealt with neighborhood representatives. And by the way, the neighborhood representatives were very well aware of this fact. Um, so the, and, and these imperatives had less to do with social inclusion or preventing displacement and more to do with ensuring that Drexel's development partners and their investors would see an adequate return on investment, which is how you saw public assets like University City High School replaced by new structures that were owned by Drexel and its development uh, partners. Um, and, you know, the kind of irony of that whole thing is that um, the school had been built in the late 1960s really as a way um, to subvert a promise that the redevelopment authority had made to citizens groups that they would that at least part of the universe that part of the area that they were planning to demolish would 
be preserved for rehabilitated housing. But the West Philadelphia Corporation really didn't want that, and so they actually like really aggressively pushed this idea that there needed to be a high school there. So that was, you know, and, and um, so the so, so families were really being dis were displaced by this public institution, and then, you know, 40, 50 years later, the public institution was demolished again. Um, so, um, you know, so it's important to underline that nobody was directly displaced for any of this new development. Um, you know, direct displacement is frowned upon now, and planners are kind of contrite about the extent to which it happened on their watch in previous decades. Um, but nevertheless, displacement effects uh, were and are observable in the communities adjacent to the Innovation District developments. Over the course of the 2010s, rents rose dramatically in the two census tracts that comprised the Mantua neighborhood, census tracts uh, 108 and 109. Uh, those who owned homes saw their property taxes skyrocket, um, and loss of ownership through foreclosure was very common. Um, and to avoid, to avoid this fate, many people were selling their homes for cash to real estate companies whose interest was in the land. Um, the Funeral for a Home project undertaken by Temple University art students in 2014 in collaboration with several organizations in Mantua dramatized the loss that occurs when buildings to which residents have symbolic attachments um, become, from the point of view of real estate economic, worthless. Like, you know, in other words, it was it was more valuable to tear this building down and build on the underlying land. Um, so Funeral for a Home was a day-long event it's structured around a ceremony commemorating the demise of a building at 3711 Mellon Street, this house. Um, so you can see there was a service, there was a choir, there were garlands of flowers. They, they um, ultimately went to the junkyard in a procession to deposit the remains of the house. Um, and then there was an outdoor lunch, which is uh, the image on the front of the book, um, if you have happened to see the book itself. Um, the issue then was that while Drexel's Office of University Partnerships was investing in children and investing in adults and in community development in the Promise Zone, its real estate partnerships were driving up the price of land and housing. And that was making it very difficult for economically insecure households to remain in the area. This is a classic paradox of economic reinvestment, in that, and it's very common. It's happening virtually everywhere that universities are partnering with developers on innovation districts. Uh, it's not at all unique to West Philadelphia. The challenge of it was recognized in a neighborhood plan that was released in 2013 by a group of leaders who would soon formally incorporate, formally incorporate into the Mantua Civic Association. Um, and that they're very much also part of the story, but um, I don't really have time to go into their story in, in detail in this talk. Um, but as you can see, they were very quite, they said, you know, the threat of displacement is a concern. Um, we expect development pressure to increase, and we need a set of targeted strategies um, th to protect homeowners and uh, to expand affordable rental options. Um, so, um, yes, okay. Um, um, university cities experience, whoops, sorry. University cities experience is relevant to any city where large scale publicly subsidized investment is exerting influence on property values in nearby neighborhoods. And it's particularly relevant to cities where an eds and meds specialization, universities and hospitals are big elements of the revitalization formula. The literature on anchor institutions, eds and meds, demonstrates how they boost wealth in their neighborhoods while supporting municipal and regional economies. It also documents the benefits that come from partnerships that faculty and students forge with uh, school districts and government agencies and community-based organizations. And yet, at the end of the day, the real estate development people always seem to hold more cards than the university community partnerships people. Um, and so the recommendations that I make in my book are geared toward aggressive interventions that remove at least some land and housing from the speculative marketplace in order that people of moderate means can continue to live in these improving neighborhoods where amenities like public space, access to healthy food, and high-performing schools are going to be intensifying in the next several years. So, um, you know, these are just some recommendations for the city of Philadelphia and for universities. Um, 
And for the most part, um, they are pretty uh, ab ferociously resisted by city officials because those, those officials are concerned about um, the de about uh, hampering development, and also because if they are asked to provide public land, like land from the land bank um, and land that's uh, sold in the sheriff sale process, they tend to want to use that land to generate revenue for the municipal budget, which is completely understandable because balancing Philadelphia's budget every year is an agonizing task. So, um, you know, you can kind of understand it, but at the same time, this is the public land is really a resource, and I try to make the point that you know this is a resource that isn't going to be around too much longer, and that um, and it really could could uh, make a difference between people having to leave um, these neighborhoods near the innovation districts um, and being able to stay there. Um, and there's actually an interesting ha thing happening right now um, in a different part of West Philadelphia here on 40th and Market Street where this star is. There's a complex called the University City Townhomes uh, which a private owner has been operating under a contract with HUD, and these homes were built in the early 80s with equity from the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program on land that actually was also part of the University City Urban Renewal Area. Um, the land actually was bought in 1983, or sold in 1983 to the private developer for $1, and now they uh, are going to try and sell it for $100 million so that the people who live in the townhomes um, are going to be evicted at the end of the year unless some kind of r miracle happens. So there's a, a strong resi resident-led movement to save the townhomes that has developed and supported by a, a number of activists in West Philadelphia, including uh, Drexel and Penn students. Um, so that's just an example of, of a situation that's you know, happening in real time right now. Um, there are also some broader recommendations that I wanted to mention, and they're more, they're a little bit more um, philosophical in nature. The first is that we, we need to sort of expand our definition of investment to cover investment that's non-financial in nature. Um, investment of time, investment of care, investment of social capital. You know, the idea is that economic development officials often focus on, you know, the dollars of capital pledged and square feet to be constructed and things like, and, and use those as benchmarks of economic development accomplishments. Um, whereas people who are living in the neighborhoods conceive of investments in ways that it's not really possible to denominate in dollar terms. Um, and I think that planners would do well to honor those more. Um, the second uh, has to do with how planners and economic development policymakers think about innovation. Reliance on real estate return as the animating force behind innovation-led economic development confines us to the belief that only by attracting new residents and employees to newly constructed neighborhoods uh, can cities develop economically. Um, and in fact, I met a lot of people in my research who had a lot of innovative ideas. It's just that they weren't uh, they weren't able to afford apartments in in this. Uh, apartment complex, which is uh, in the U City Square Innovation District. Um, uh, you know, they, they live in places like these, and somehow that means that they're not as innovative. <laughs> um, and the, finally, the, I think it's important to talk about history um, more. We have a responsibility to recognize the ways that past policies and past sort of theories, like il infiltration theory, um, discrimination, the real estate color line, have prevented households of color from accumulating material wealth and social capital. So even now when we talk about um, equitable development and, um, you know, very easily and social inclusion has become a, a very commonplace term, you know, community-based advocates are still operating in a milieu where a lot of the political discourse um, is, you know, not very friendly to policy recommendations like these, in part because um, of, there's a belief that low educational attainment, economic vulnerability, and counters with the criminal justice system stem primarily from people's own limitations, their own poor choices. Um, and so, you know, these, these kinds of policy measures are considered kind of unwarranted or, or unrealistic. And you know we're still blaming poverty uh, on the poor, and that is due to not having reckoned with the historical record. Um, and that's another—that's something that I think hasn't changed enough since the days of urban renewal. So, 
Um, if we make some of the larger conceptual changes that I've suggested, perhaps it will become easier to persuade universities and city officials to adopt some of these policies that ensure that low-income people living near university-sponsored redevelopment projects will be able to stay put and experience the benefits of innovation-based urban revitalization. Thank you very much. Professor Flowers. So first of all, thank you for the lovely talk. Uh, and I appreciate, first of all, that you actually propose potential solutions. Uh, it is often the case that the discussions like these are excellent at, at analyzing and dissecting all of the horrific things that have gone wrong. And the question of what, what we do next is often like, Jesus, I don't know, you know, pray. Uh, but I'm also struck that different audiences, for the, there are many different audiences for work like this. But given that we're here at a university, where ostensibly the, the core mission we have is the dissemination and, and production of knowledge, I wonder if you ever encountered a university official, and you're right to point out that many universities are in this role, a provost or a senior vice president for community relations who actually would be forthright and say, well, actually now one of our core missions is elevating real estate development in our surrounding neighborhoods. Is there, are people willing to acknowledge that as now a core value of the university, or is it still couched in a kind of language uh, that seeks to elide that condition? Um, it's an interesting question. I think there's a lot of ways to, um, I, I think they're sort of in denial about it themselves. Like, I, I mean, in a way, I think that there's, there's um, sort of a, an idea that there can be a win-win, you know, that the university can achieve its uh, expansion and generate revenue and that the property development partners can also generate revenue and uh, achieve their desired return on investment and we can also be inclusive and development without de development have development without displacement like I, I don't I don't think you'd ever see somebody actually say like real estate development is a core value because I don't think they honestly believe that I think they believe that social inclusion is a core value and that innovation districts are going to generate economic prosperity and that the economic prosperity that innovation districts create are going to be very good on a, you know, on a broad basis and they're in the public interest and who could be against them, who could be against innovation, right? Um, so, like, so, so I don't think that there's a, um, I'm not at all surprised that, 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 that it hasn't sort of come down to that, um, but I don't think anybody's like obfuscating uh, Purposely, I think that it's just people get kind of lost in the, um, you know, in the in what amounts to being kind of double speak. <laughs> I don't know if you want to comment on that, Harley, because you've also written on this topic as well. No. <laughs> okay, we've got a, a microphone too. So um, for our next question, um, let's take a second to get the microphone there. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, one of your recommendations was some kind of rent stabilization or rent um, possible caps. How do you make sure that when you're doing that, you're also like allowing for entry of other individuals? Are you kind of denying other people entry into University City or is this more to protect legacy individuals in the area? Um, that's a good question. I think that you, you know, there there are ways to sort of parse out what proportion of rent um, that someone pays is going to actually maintaining their their unit, and what proportion is, um, you know, going on the profit side of the ledger. And I certainly don't believe that people who are, invest in real estate don't deserve to earn profits. Um, but I think that there are ways of um, creating systems that compensate owners and operators of real estate fairly while keeping prices reasonable. And I think that that could be done both for pe incumbent residents, people, legacy residents, as you put it, um, and also for residents of new units that, particularly units that are developed with public subsidy. I think that, that could be um, built into that. But I appreciate the, the complexity of it, and I, I certainly, um, you know, I, I would uh, 
have a lot of admiration for somebody who could design a system like that that worked well. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Just a second while we get the microphone over here. Hello. Uh, do you think that cities will ever get to the point of uh, how mutual aid groups act to like um, meeting people where they are and like uh, you know giving like more of need-based help rather than like a one-size-fits-all solution to these uh, to like displacement? Did you mention mutual aid? Is that what you said? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, that this is. Thank you for asking that question because it gives me a, a chance to talk about something I really didn't. Um, well, didn't have time to do in the talk. So this organization, the Mantua Civic Association, was a really interesting group to study because they, um, they are sort of the descendant organizationally of an organization called Mantua Community Planners, which started in the early 1960s. And they're, the founders of that organization were very much about self-help and mutual aid and um, People, like, the, the, and there was a lot of gang violence in this Mantua neighborhood at the time, and you had leaders who were really trying to um, stem that by engaging young people in community service projects and in rehabilitating homes and running play streets for kids and doing, you know, doing gardening and community agriculture. And that organization, there's a whole chapter about that organization in the book. Um, it kind of faded uh, after about 15 years, but the people who organized it rem continued to live in the neighborhood. And actually, a lot of people who had been helped by that organization like went off and had careers, and then but, was, but kind of remembered their experience with the organization. And so this the, this group kind of reconstituted itself in 2013 um, around the rehabilitation of a housing. Uh, low-income housing development that had become severely distressed and dilapidated, and they kind of reorganized themselves and formed the Mantua Civic Association. Um, and I think this group, very, they very much embody that sort of, like, we can help ourselves if we have the resources, um, you know, the, and there's um, an enormous amount of volunteer time and energy that is um, expended by the members of this group. Um, and, and part of what they also do is interface with Drexel University and try and uh, fight for policies that will enable them to continue doing their kind of self-help mutual aid in the neighborhood. I'm not sure how well that answers your question, but I think this is just an example of, it's not just about like we need more government resources in here to, to um, you know, solve all these problems. It's that, you know, we have, talent here, we have um, uh, ingenuity here, we can, uh, if, if we have um, the resources to work with, we can really help each other out and, and be the neighborhood that we want to be. And that was one of the inspiring things about um, doing this research, because I attended the meetings of this group for about a, a year and a half, the monthly meetings. Professor Hamlin. Thank you for your talk. This was great. Um, this is not really a question as much as a comment, but I feel like what you're doing with this book by highlighting how the communities still feel the effects of things like urban renewal is really important for, uh, you know, as students, we tend to, like the students will be in class, they learn this history as though this is something that occurred a long time ago and it's got kind of nothing to do with now, but actually what you're highlighting is the way in which those communities really remember this trauma and see it as that. And, and so when you're going in to do redevelopment today, you're still, there's still that history there among the people who live there. And so I really appreciated that piece of what you're trying to do. Um, so I just want to make that comment. Thank you. And I, it's not only about the people who remember it and are traumatized by it. I think that it, there's some of the same kind of habits of mind persist. So this is, is this idea that um, if, an, if a neighborhood doesn't have, um, you know, uh, 
wealthy people in it, it's just not as important. Or it just, if it has, if, it, you know, if there's vacant land, then the thing to do with that vacant land is to build new. Um, housing at the kind of using the principle of highest and best use, and, and there's the, so I think that some of the same kind of devaluation that took that I described taking place during the 1960s and during the urban renewal area is happening in a in a much like softer, subtler way now. But you sort of had like there there are some occasionally you'll see a newspaper article about. Mantua, or you know, and it, they'll, they'll call it sort of like a trashy neighborhood. And thank goodness the innovation districts are coming in because it's going to make things so much better. You know, so you still have this like, I mean, some sometimes geographers call it territorial stigmatization, and I think I use that. Um, you know, and it really is like a real thing where people, you know, the, just be, because it's inhabited by people who don't have a lot of wealth. It's, it's considered to be, you know, bad or, or like, you know, we should, we should get rid of what's there and, and make it better. And then what, what makes it, what's making it better is, you know, tends to be something that's going to generate uh, profit for a developer. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm not, you know, Neil Smith said that a long time ago. So. <laughs> uh, to, uh, Professor Glenn Massacre. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. That was really awesome. I was I was wondering if if the implication of your recommendations is that the scale of these planning efforts should be much smaller spatially. Um, should should this be planned? That the, can you do the things that you're suggesting we ought to uh, in trying to redevelop around a university? Should we do that at the scale of the district? Um, can we achieve the kinds of precision and sort of land value capture that, that you're suggesting if we're, yeah, sort of planning at the district scale? I'm thinking, you know, Bob Beauregard wrote about site planning as inherently an act of erasure. Um, because once you're at that site scale, you know, you're drawing diagrams that, that only reflect one or two of the characteristics and inherently erase some of the complexities and the histories that are embedded in that, in that site. And that was, your, your um, recommendations don't talk about scale of the planning effort. And I was wondering if, if that was intentional or, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess my response to that would be yes and. <laughs> um, I, I think, I, I anticipate, I hope that um, I will have the opportunity to deliver this presentation to Philadelphia audiences and kind of what they can get their head around is not, you know, we need large scale transformation of social housing and land use. It's more like, okay, you know, there's properties in the land bank that you could release to mission driven organizations or put in a land trust like tomorrow. <laughs> there's nothing. And so I think that part of the, the, the small scale of it has to do with the, the the, the political work that I hope that this book might end up doing in University City, but I completely agree with you that you know there's there's a huge role for people who are thinking bigger and thinking about how to change things systematically. I mean, and interestingly, I mean, I did talk to people who work for the city in the context of the research, and what they would say was like, well, even if we were to give the land over to a community development organization to build deeply affordable housing, the amount of federal subsidy that you would need to build housing that was really really accessible to people of with, you know at low income levels. You know, we're not that we're not seeing that kind of subsidy. Um, we're not, and so part, you know, and and to some extent, that's passing the buck. That's just sort of saying, well, until things change in Washington, we can't do anything here in Philadelphia. But I mean, there's truth to it as well. You know, it's in, it's very given this the social housing production system that we have, which is very um, dependent on tax credit financing. It's just really, really hard to build housing for people who are. Um, you know, way below median income, and so. Okay. Okay. Last two questions. <laughs> Go ahead. And then Jason, you'll close us out after. Okay. You can just. So my question is about the role of the three institutions you were discussing, so public, private, and universities. Do you think that that's changed um, with the creation of innovation districts as opposed to um, urban renewal? So you're asking if, well, so under urban renewal, um, the, 
there was federal money and it was passed through redevelopment authorities at the city level and then redevelopment authorities would give or sell land to developers to build, you know, to revitalize areas. Um, and this is a little different just in the sense that there's no federal money involved now and it's just about the universities um, getting into relationships with companies. That, and there's, there's companies that sort of specialize in this. That one of them is called Wexford Science and Technology. Um, Brandywine Real, Real Estate Investment Trust is a big one in Philadelphia as well. And what they're kind of, what, what they, they um, their strategy has to do with the fact that there's a lot of tax advantage um, to developing on land that's owned by a not-for-profit organization, and that all, often these arrangements involve ground leases also, and the, um, uh, you can deduct ground lease payments from income tax, and so there's, there's a whole lot of like tax privilege that goes into the creation of these innovation districts, and so you don't, they're, they're much more complex now, and they're much more sort of connected to kind of global capital because you have like sovereign wealth funds that are putting money in into the uh, REITs like Brandywine Real, Real Estate Investment Trust. So you basically, I mean, at the time, there, I guess I, the way I would think about it is that in the urban renewal area, there was kind of like a blunt instrument, like the federal money, the federal government gave money to the city, the city, you know, did the demolition and then subsidized the redevelopment. And now there's just so many more, like it's, it's global and there's lots of like sort of strands of capital involved and, and uh, and uh, and it's also all about the kind of ability to use real estate to shield oneself from tax liability, which can easily be syndicated. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's kind of how I think of the difference now. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. Um, thank you for this wonderful talk. I was curious about the tension you noted between the real estate development arm of the university and the service activities of the university. And I'm curious, as in your recommendations, you know, are there solutions to address that? Is it leadership? Is it, should these real estate development arms be more like traditional community development organizations? Because the frame of reference and the language and their metrics are always just so different since they're hyper-focused on real estate. Shouldn't universities be less like corporations? <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, it would be it, it would be great, but I think there's a reason why, and 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 I think this is something. Again, I'm going to uh, re refer to. Uh, Dr. Etienne's work because he wrote a, a book about the West Philadelphia initiatives, which is a, um, you know, kind of actually was the blueprint for what Drexel is doing now. John Fry, who's currently the president of Drexel, used to work as an executive VP at University of Pennsylvania. He unrolled the West Philadelphia initiatives there. And so his, um, you know, there, there was, um, I've lost my train of thought, but the, um, the point I was making is that the um, yeah the West Philadelphia initiatives um, were really about um, sort of improving areas near campus for people who are affiliated with the universities, and that was the imperative that the real estate people had um, and so it would be pretty hard to, to say to a real estate development department, well, actually, you're, you're not, you, you can unhitch yourself from the institutional imperatives that we have, which have to do with you know, our bottom line. So. Well, on that sunny note, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's all thank uh, Laura for her presentation. Thank you very much.